name Mrs. Nithya, wife of Mrs. Kumar, age 28 years. Uh, she is coming from Rospit. Her education is BSc. Her occupation is also. Her socioeconomic status belongs to class 2, according to modified BG Prasad scale. She is a primary gravida. Her last date of menstrual period is 15th August 2020. Her expected date of delivery is 22 May 2021. Her period of gestation is 39 weeks. Her uh, blood group is O positive. She is booked and immunized. Nearest health facility is PHC, last bed, 10 minutes by walk from home. Chief complaints, the patient came to the hospital for safe confinement. Sister present pregnancy, first trimester, after 40 days of amenorrhea, she confirmed pregnancy by urine pregnancy test, and it is a spontaneous conception, registered at IGMC RA at 12 weeks, and dating scan was taken during the same visit. No stuff. Hyperemesis gravidarum, no history of breeding per vagina, no history of burning maturation, no history of pure thrashes, no history of any drug intake, no history of radiation exposure, folic acid tablets were prescribed. All the investigations were found to be normal. Second trimester, she had two antenatal visits. Beginning was felt at 20 weeks. First dose of TD was given at 16 weeks. Second dose of TD was given at 20 weeks. IFA tablets taken regularly in the morning. Calcium tablets were taken regularly in the afternoon. No stuff of bleeding per vagina, no stuff of headache, blurring of vision, epigastric pain, decreased urine output, period edema, no stuff of increased frequency of maturation, excessive weight gain, no stuff of burning maturation, screening for diabetes done by dipsy, test at 24 weeks and it is found to be normal. Panomeric scan done at 20 weeks also found to be normal. Third trimester, number of antenatal visits was two. IFA tablets were taken regularly in the morning, calcium tablets were taken in the afternoon. Continued to preserve fetal movements, no stress of headache, blurring of vision, epigastric pain, oliguria, pedal edema, no stress of increased frequency of maturation, excessive weight gain, burning maturation, no stress of pain in the abdomen, no stress of bleeding per vagina, no stress of licking per vagina. Moving into menstrual history, age at menarche, 13 years, menstrual cycle, regular, 5 day cycle for 28 days with normal blood flow, no stress of pain and the passage of clots, marital history, age at marriage is found to be 26 years. And it is a non consanguineous marriage. Past history, no history of blood transfusion, no history of previous surgeries, no history of diabetes, hypertension, TB, jaundice, epilepsy, asthma, no history of fractures of the hip, no history of hip rickets, polyamide. Family history, uh, no history of diabetes mellitus, hypertension, TB, asthma in the family, no history of any congenital anomalies in the family, no history of winning in the family. Personal history, diet, big style. Physical activity, she is a housewife. Appetite is normal. No sleep disturbances. Normal bowel and bladder habits. No stuff addictions. No stuff allergy to any drugs or foods. Okay. So we'll go with the, uh, we'll finish with the history part now. Okay. okay. Yeah. So patient profile, you have written everything perfectly. That is good. Okay. And uh, date of admission, date of examination. These are the two additional things which you should always mention in the uh, initial uh, personal uh, part of the patient details. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay so that is the one thing. And why why do you think it is important? Date of admission and date of examination. Because uh, in order to track the progress of the patient and uh, to track Good. the uh, yes. mode of delivery of the patient, whether to do vaginal or cesarean. Okay. That so doesn't depend to... upon date of admission, date of examination. See, main thing is whatever the chief complaint patient has come with. Okay, her complaints may not be correlating with your examination finding, mainly because like she's admitted for high blood pressure, she's admitted for anemia, should have undergone blood transfusion or should have taken treatment. When you examine her, there is no anemia. Or when you examine her, the her blood pressure is normal, right? So duration okay. of hospital stay and the progress in the hospital stay can be made out by knowing the date of admission and date of examination. Only if you have examined, like she's admitted and examined on the same day or maybe the next day, her history and your findings will cor correlate always. Right? Okay. okay. So that is the importance. So you should always mention date of admission and date of examination in the personal details of the patient first. That is important. And okay. whenever it is more than one day, when the date of admission and date of examination are more than one day, then the progress in the hospital stay should be mentioned in your history of present illness. Like if you are writing any HOPI, then you, you okay. mentioned that patient is admitted with such and such a complaint. After admitting to the hospital, what has happened in the hospital stay? That okay. also should be written in the HOPA. That is why okay. we should always write date of admission and date of examination. Other than okay. that, everything is perfect. Okay, yes. You okay. should mention okay. booked and immunized in the personal details 
or you can mention in the history of present pregnancy also that also can be done yes here, okay. here you have mentioned in the beginning itself good okay okay, okay. yeah so now currently she doesn't have any complaint she has come to the hospital for basically safe her safe confinement 39 weeks she is admitted now okay okay generally we don't admit patients at uh, like before the expected date of delivery or un unless you plan for induction in low risk pregnancies okay because okay. here probably it's a high risk pregnancy short stature you would have admitted earlier at 39 weeks otherwise we usually don't admit the patients at 39 weeks for safe confinement okay that's okay. a one okay. thing which should be kept in okay. mind if they ask okay. you like do you wanted to admit this patient for safe confinement do you admit all the cases at 39 weeks generally we don't only you know, for okay. high risk pregnancies when you are planning for termination of pregnancy when you are planning some high risk factors are there only then you admit early otherwise okay, low okay. risk pregnancies are not admitted early for safe okay, confinement okay okay, okay ma'am okay so yes all the things are correct you have written when was her first antenatal visits by 40 days that you have written and uh, she is a booked and immunized uh, uh, at a nearby hospital okay and all the negative history you have mentioned properly preferably you write she has taken folic acid instead of writing folic acid tablets are prescribed whether she has taken or not is important for us okay she has received okay. folic acid or she is taking folic acid from second month onwards third month onwards that is important okay, okay. okay. so why why do we give folic acid in the pregnancy protein uh, to pre prevent the neural tube defects like spina bifida and encephalitis so, okay so when does the neural tube close it closes very early as early as Six weeks. Six, six weeks, weeks of pregnancy itself, neural tube closes actually. Okay. okay, so ideally it should be folic acid should be given. When should we give folic acid to prevent neural tube defects in the, the fetus? First trimester. Yeah, so but but neural, uh, I mean, but when the patient come to the hospital itself is six weeks already over. They miss the periods and only then they come to the hospital, right? So oh. it is already two weeks more than the missing days. It's already six weeks. so whatever folic acid we are giving it may not completely help in the first trimester ideally it should be taken very conceptionally before planning the pregnancy at least two months prior to planning pregnancy they should start taking folic acid okay so because okay. neural tube closes as early as 6 weeks the first okay. trimester folic acid it may not completely prevent by the time she uh, registers her pregnancy it will itself will be 6 to 8 weeks okay so ideally okay, okay. folic acid tablet should be given before the pregnancy like when they were the, whenever the patient is planning for a pregnancy okay. then folic acid tablet should be given okay. as you should take folic acid for the prevention of neural tube defects otherwise okay, it okay. doesn't help other than as a nutritional supplement in the first trimester okay 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 yeah and right you have mentioned all the history negative history of written what treatment she has taken and also she has undergone investigations and she was told that the reports are normal yes correct so second trimester again the history is correct all the, she has taken uh, two antenatal visits you have written number of visits what is the importance of writing one number of visits in the first trimester second trimester third trimester why do we write that because to find it's a booked case of a uh, pregnancy or okay, it's an booked case yes to know whether she is a booked or unbooked booked case do you know what do you mean by regular antenatal visits in pregnancy uh it should be consist of three antenatal visits uh she should be provided with and uh calcium supplementations uh immunized with the two tt dose good um, but that is the yes. criteria for booked case booked case call it as a booked and immunized yes you you said she should have at least three antenatal visits okay and uh, yes, she should have taken two doses of tt she should have taken yes. at least 100 tablets of iron and folic acid that was the older criteria for to say that it's a booked case now the newer who guidelines says that actually eight visits should be there to call it as a booked case actually okay but what i asked was regular antenatal yes. visit that is she has to come once in a month once once in a month up to 28 weeks At after 28 weeks she has to come once in two weeks up to 32 weeks After okay, that, six okay. weeks she has to come weekly once. That is what you call it as a regular antenatal visit for a low risk pregnancy. For a without oh. any for a, without any risk factors, we are we always ask the patient to come once in a month up to twenty eight weeks. After okay, twenty, okay. we ask them to come once in two weeks. Okay. Then only up by thirty six weeks we ask them to come by weekly. That is how generally they attend the antenatal clinic. Okay. okay whenever the patient like there are patients who are living in the rural area who are not able to make antenatal visits for them that minimum criteria of booking applies but okay. otherwise okay. patients who are actually booked with us who come uh, ancs we are, that when we call it as a regular anc it is like once in a month once in up to 28 weeks that is a standard criteria okay okay so okay because she is booked in urban setup because it's a pondicherry setup i think 
station would have visited regularly. She would have visited yes. more than this. That's what I feel. So okay. whenever you take this history, I mean, generally you will always think only about booking visits. Okay. So okay. always concentrate on the maybe should have come regularly once in every month up to twenty. Okay. okay. Should have okay. done. Okay. So that should be written. Yes. All the other okay. things I am discussing the history part basically because these are the some common simple mistakes which are made in the exam. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So okay. Definitely. But before that, I just wanted to point out few common things which are missed by the uh, students. Okay. 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 So iron and folic acid. Yes, they have taken regularly, and you have specified like iron folic acid taken regularly in the morning. Okay. Yes. So generally, when do you give iron folic acid tablets? Generally, iron tablets are taken in the night. And it is usually right. Patient is taking iron and calcium supplements regularly. That is enough. Okay. okay. You need not commit like that. But if you commit that she is taken in the morning and this thing, then they'll ask you. Generally, when do you prescribe? Iron and folic acid tablets are generally taken in the night time, mainly because okay. they usually have some gastrointestinal disturbances. GERD symptoms are common with iron folic acid tablet. That is why they usually are taken after food in the night. Okay, so that it will mask okay. GERD symptoms to some extent. Okay, okay. Yes, calcium tablet tablets are taken in the other time of the day. They should never be taken together. Iron and calcium tablets should never be taken together because uh, calcium will inhibit the absorption of iron. Yes. Okay. All the others again, it is correct, and you have specifically written screening of diabetes. Okay, routinely yes, we do between twenty four to twenty eight. We do uh, testing for GDM screening test for GDM. So if yes. you write, she has undergone all the investigations. And she was told that the report is novel because the exam you will not know whether it uh, like patient may or may may tell you that it's a seventy five grams glucose, hundred eight grams glucose. They may or may not know. So you you don't know whether it's a DIPSI test or GTT what she has undergone like that. Okay, so okay. you can say that patient underwent all the blood tests. Okay, if they okay. ask okay, standard test which is done in your uh, in your institute, then you can answer that it is a DIPSI test. Okay, okay, okay. Because patient will never tell you that I have undergone deep sea test and all, or she may or may not know uh, 100 grams of glucose like that, 75 okay, grams, okay. grams. Okay. So if okay. you mention she has undergone a uh, blood test, including glucose test, and she was told that the reports are normal, oh, that okay. if you mention, good enough. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Third trimester again, yes. Number of antenatal visits you should mention all the complaints and common uh, complaints that is usually preeclampsia and GDM we always rule out in the second and. third trimester the history is perfect there is no doubts in this okay? okay fine yeah so menstrual history again it is correct lmp should always be mentioned in the menstrual history additionally though you have mentioned lmp edd in the beginning in the personal details lmp yes, should be written in the menstrual history again okay yes, so marital history is correct past history is correct and here you have specifically written history of fractures of hip rickets and poliomyelitis why why do you think it is important in this case Why did you ask? It is we routinely we don't ask for everyone. No, was there history of road traffic accident, hip uh, any fracture of the hip or tuberculosis of the hip, polio myelitis? We don't ask routinely, right? It's not a routine. Yes, ma'am. Because right. it's a shock. Because pelvis is a short stage, ma'am. While delivering, is there any fracture of the hip, so it can cause a severe a damage to the hip. So we ask any history of fracture of the hip or kids. Okay, so routinely we no need to write that. You can say that like when you have when I have done a pelvic assessment, I felt that it is a contracted pelvis, so I wanted to ask for the risk factor. So retrospectively, again I asked. Okay, oh, 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 so because okay. routinely we don't ask for the uh, fractures of the hip, rickets, polio, myelitis. Yes, they are one of the important causes for CPD, though they are rare. They are yes, quite ma'am. rare. Yeah, but we should always ask for the congenital and acquired causes of CPD. So you can mention that if you feel that uh, pelvis was contracted in your examination, so retrospectively I want to ask for the risk factors. That's why I asked this history. Okay. 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 So you can mention that. Okay. Yeah. Family history and personal history. There is no doubt. Okay. Everything okay. is okay. correct. Okay. Yeah. We'll go ahead with the general examination. Okay. Okay. Uh, general examination of the patient. The patient was comfortable for examination. Weight fifty five kilogram. Height one thirty eight centimeter. The BMI twenty eight point eight, and it is considered to be overweight. Thyroid is present. No ectus, clubbing, sinusitis, lymphadenopathy, period edema. Gait and spine examination found to be normal. Thyroid examination is normal. Breast examination is found to be normal. <coughs> Moving to vitals, a pulse rate eighty two beats per minute, a regular rhythm, good volume and character, blood pressure one twenty four by eighty millimeter of mercury, right arm at sitting position, respiratory rate is eighteen breaths per minute, temperature is found to be above average. 
moving to obstetric examination inspection abdominal is uniformly distended spherical in shape pendulous and fangs are full umbilicus is inverted subumbilical flattening is present linear nigra and stay gravidarum are present no visible scars and sinuses renal orifices are intact with no cough pimples palpation pandalet corresponds to 36 weeks symphysis of pandalet is 36 cm pandal grip shows broad soft and regular non palatable mass suggesting of breach lateral grip shows smooth curve uniform resistance well in left side suggesting pedal back and small irregular knobs in right side suggesting limbets first pelvic grip shows hard globular non palatable mass suggesting cephalic presentation second pelvic grip head is engaged moving to auscultation pedal arch sounds heard near the left flank Pedal heart rate is 140 beats per minute. The pelvic examination, obstetric conjugate is 9 cm. Sides of pelvic walls are converging. Subpelvic angle is acute. Investigations. Uh, investigations. We'll go ahead. We'll do it later. So we'll go ahead with the examination again. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So general physical examination. Uh, you you can mention that uh, she is short stature and moderately nourished. Built we usually ref, uh, tell in terms of stature. Okay, like tall build or short okay. stature. If she's, if okay. you feel she's specifically short stature, you can mention that uh, the lady is short stature and uh, moderately nourished. Okay, okay. okay, we generally say built and nourishment, moderate built and nourishment. Here you can say she is short stature and moderately nourished. Uh, weight is correct. Height is one thirty eight centimeter. And uh, BMI when we calculate the body mass index, BMI is calculated for the pre pregnancy weight. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Here yes, you know the pre pregnancy weight in this case. Or if Sorry. you don't know the first, uh, yeah, pre-pregnancy weight, at least we take the weight in the first trimester, like booking visit, first trimester okay. when she has booked, because weight uh, that can also be taken for the calculation of BMI, because yes, weight gain in the first trimester is hardly around 0.5 to 1 kg, not even more than that. It is hardly yes. 0.5 kg. Usually, weight gain in the first trimester is very less. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. If the pre-pregnancy weight is not known, in that case, we usually take the weight in the first trimester. For calculating yes, the BMI, and yes, you should always mention pre-pregnancy weight, current weight, and weight gain in pregnancy. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Only then you can calculate the BMI. Okay? okay. Otherwise, all the pregnant women usually put on around twelve to fifteen kgs in the pregnancy. Everyone will come under overweight and BMI, overweight and obese in BMI. Okay. okay If you take the current weight for calculating the BMI. Okay. So you should always take pre-pregnancy weight or first trimester weight for calculating the BMI. Okay. That is important. Okay. Uh, okay. Here you have taken the pre-pregnancy weight. Yes, ma'am. Pre I mean, probably she was forty-five kgs at that time because even yes. if she has gained at least ten kg, mum, ten kg she has gained forty-five kgs. I think then it will be normal, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So maybe you by mistake you have taken the current weight. Ideally, you should take only pre-pregnancy weight for calculating the BMI. The BMI. All the others are normal. Okay. Can you tell me importance of examination of the gait and spine, particularly in this case? uh spine for any spinal deformities like kyphosis scoliosis to look for for gait uh is there any gait abnormalities like uh, like a padding gait latching gait so here yeah, is something like polio acquired conditions you mentioned like the patient yes. has fracture or any fracture. uh yeah a polio myelitis limping deformities that will indirectly reflect upon the pelvic abnormalities okay High okay, kyphosis okay. may not reflect. Basically, it may not affect the pelvis. But when the kyphosis is affecting the lumbosacral area, lumbar area, then definitely they getting forward of the sacral bone. So that can lead to, or there can be it's just in the lumbar, but sacrum is not involved. In that case, also there can be funneling of the pelvis. Funneling of the pelvis. Or contracted pelvis later. Okay. okay. So kyphoscoliosis, okay. particularly in the lumbosacral area, are important. Okay, spine examination, which will which will give you an indirect uh, estimate about the pelvis. Gait mainly limping conditions, limping conditions. There, there is any like polio myelitis, shortening of the limbs. Okay, so that yeah, can tell you yeah. again that there can be abnormality of the pelvis also. The pelvis also. Because okay. of the yeah, uh, because because of the um, like patient has got scoliosis, uh, uh, scoliosis with limping deformity and all. Then it could be there can be jetting of the acetabulum inside. That can again. Okay. But uh, reduce the pelvic diameters. Okay. Okay. So okay. Ma'am. Okay. Scoliosis actually lead to abnormalities in the pelvic diameter, mainly the inlet okay. and the cavity. That is cavity. why it is important. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yes
okay yes ma'am yes ma'am vitals all are correct blood pressure is always checked in the sitting position it is important you mentioned but even if you yes, don't write right routinely also it doesn't matter but if you take yes, a case of hypertensive disorder in pregnancy they generally ask you how do you check the blood pressure which position so the, in that yes, case you may have to position you have to mention the position of the patient how you have checked the, the patient patient okay fine yeah so this is correct inspection you have written all the findings are uh, correct it is normal and you have specifically written subumbilical flattening is present what does it suggest You have written umbilicus is averted, and there is subumbilical flattening is present. Is it important? Generally, we write it. You have written abdomen is uniformly distended. It is not a case, ma'am. Sir, full and umbilicus is normal. Like linear Niagara style gravity number C. That's what we write. We usually don't yes. write subumbilical flattening routinely. So subumbilical flattening. Occipital uh, posterior position yes. suggesting of. Good. Good. Yes. So subumbilical flattening is mainly seen. It is not like always diagnostic of occipital posterior, but it goes yes, in yes. favor of abnormal position. That is mal position. Okay. Position. Okay. Because generally in occipital anterior, when the occiput is anterior, even fetal spine is anterior. So okay, fetal okay. spine is lifting up the anterior abdominal wall uniformly. Uterus is also convex, and abdominal wall also completely it is convex. Okay. When the but okay. fetal Occiput is posterior, spine is also posterior, so there is no lifting up of the lower uterine wall or the anti-abdominal wall. That leads to subumbilical flattening. Okay, okay subumbilical okay. flattening goes in favor of malposition. So that you should always keep it in your mind. Okay. 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 Okay, ma'am. Fine. Fine. Yeah. So palpation, you have written fundal height is around thirty-six weeks. Thirty-six. Yes. But here the flanks are full, right? You said yes, that the flanks are full. So, if the fundal usually term pregnancy, where will be the uterine height? In term peg pregnancy, term term means thirty seven to forty two weeks, right? Yes, ma'am. Thirty nine weeks here. Patient is a term pregnancy with fullness in the flanks. So, where should have been the fundal height? Yeah, thirty two weeks. Yes, Anjali. Uh, yeah, she has also written thirty-two weeks. Yes, generally uterine height uh, is thirty-two weeks with fullness in the flanks. That is what we call it as a term pregnancy, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So here, uh, if the uterine height is thirty-six weeks with fullness in the flanks, it says that it is a old distended abdomen. That is one of the criteria to say that abdomen is old distended. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma so in term pregnancy, there are some conditions where say uterus is old distended, like in case of multiple pregnancy, polyhydramnias. Large baby, yes. like in those conditions, we say abdomen uterus is over distended. Abdomen is over distended. When one of the criteria to to say that abdomen is over distended is height is uterine height is thirty six with weeks with fullness in the flanks, or when the abdominal girth is more than hundred centimeter. That is when we say it is a over distended abdomen. But here I don't think it is abdominal over abdomen is over distended, right? So I think yes. here fundal height should have been thirty two weeks. Thirty two weeks. Okay. Okay. Yeah, generally that is the expected. So these are the some mistakes maybe you have you have made. Or probably it was thirty six weeks because of polyhydramnias. That also could be the reason. Okay, okay, okay but okay. Uh, be careful when you are seeing the examination and whenever you done the fundal height by measure by palpation, always comment. Uterine height is thirty six weeks corresponds to period of gestation. Gestation less than the period of gestation, more than the period of gestation. That should be written. Like you oh. now the patient has come with a uh, term pregnancy. Uterine yes. height should have been thirty-two weeks. Thirty-two right? weeks. Yes, yes. So you have to write uterine height is thirty-six weeks more than the period of gestation. You, you feel that it is more, probably oh, it's over distended. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. She has come with twenty weeks of pregnancy. Per abdomen, you feel it is twenty-four weeks. Or maybe she has come with twenty-eight weeks, but it is less when you are examining. So you should always write it. when it is less or more. It should be specified. If it is corresponds, okay. yes, you write only it corresponds to thirty-two weeks, which is equal to the period of gestation by her dates by her amenorrhea. Okay. Okay. So that should always be written. Okay. And symphysis of fundal height is correct. Can you tell me what is the importance of symphysis of fundal height? Why should we measure symphysis of fundal height? Okay. Generally, we measure okay. the symphysis of fundal height. Uh, one is to measure the fetal weight. That is secondary. Okay. Fetal weight measurement is done only at term. 
Yes, like yes, after ma'am. thirty-seven weeks only, we use the symphysial fundal height to calculate the estimated fetal weight. Not for preterm. Okay, we don't okay. use the symphysial fundal height to calculate the fetal weight in preterm. It is only a term pregnancy only. Term, okay? term pregnancy. Yeah. So here, generally, the purpose of measuring the symphysial fundal height is actually to check whether it corresponds to period of gestation. One thing. Yes. when it corresponds okay oh, okay okay so, so you know when the when, from when to when the symphysial fundal height corresponds to uterine height in centimeters okay so see if this is 16 weeks then the symphysial fundal height is not 16 centimeters right it doesn't yes, correspond yes. during early pregnancy yes okay. ma'am yes ma'am so you have to say that symphysial fundal height corresponds to period of gestation in yes, centimeters between okay, okay. 24 to 36 weeks Okay. Only from twenty-four weeks onwards, you start measuring the symphysial fundal height. So, okay, if it is twenty-four weeks, like if it is twenty-eight weeks, then it is twenty-eight centimeters. Yes. Okay. Okay. But when the uterine height is twenty weeks, it is not twenty centimeters. It doesn't okay. correspond during early pregnancy. Or when the uterus is twelve weeks, that is when the uterus is held felt exactly at the pubic symphysis, it is not twelve centimeters symphysial fundal height. Okay. Okay. You understood what I am saying? Yes, ma'am. Understood, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So symphysial fundal height. Corresponds to period of gestation, gestation. In each between twenty four weeks to thirty six weeks. Thirty six weeks. Okay. Okay. After thirty six weeks, also we measure symphysial fundal height. That yes, time, the purpose of measuring symphysial fundal height is to calculate the estimated fetal weight using symphysial fundal height. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. So that time, when the uterus is term pregnancy, you check whether the head is engaged or not. So symphysial fundal height minus twelve. Are minus eleven into one fifty five will give you fetal weight in grams. Okay, yes, that time we use the symphysial fundal height to calculate the fetal weight by the formula Johnson's yes, formula. Johnson's Otherwise, formula. routinely we measure symphysial fundal height only after that, only after twenty four weeks of twenty four weeks to thirty six weeks only. Okay, okay. Uh, so in a short stature woman. Yes, okay. ma'am. Uh, okay, uh, do you know how to measure the symphysial fundal height? From uh, uh, we have to measure the tape, and uh, it is yes. measured from umbilicus to pubic symphysis. Good. Okay. So when we have calculated the fundal height by by ulnar border of the uh, by, by the abdominal hand when you are palpating, yes, uh, you feel for the uterine height. That time you have asked the patient to flex her hips and knees partially, yes, right? Yes. And you have asked her to empty the bladder, all the other prerequisites you have done. So you have asked. Her to Uh, flex the hips and knees partially. Then you have and you by correcting the dextro rotation, you correct the dextro rotation and then you palpate the uterine height resistance. That is okay. fundal height by palpation. You make a mark on the fundal height. The fundal height. Then okay. ask the patient to extend her legs. Okay. This is the only measurement where you take the measurement in the extended legs. Otherwise, okay. there is upward tilt of the pubic symphysis. It will give you a wrong reading. Okay. okay. You ask the okay. patient to extend her leg. Mark the The upper border of the pubic symphysis. Then you take the measuring tape and measure the symphysial fundal height, keeping the inches facing you. Otherwise, you oh, okay. there will be a bias from your side. Like you know that it is thirty okay. two weeks, it's going to be thirty two centimeters. You try to adjust. Okay. So okay. you okay. keep the inches facing you. Then you reverse the tape and see what is the measurement. That is how you should should be measured. And okay. generally, okay. symphysial fundal height always it does correspond to fundal height, but in a normal height woman. If the patient is short stature, her trunk itself is smaller. Yes, It usually, there is always one to two centimeter lag is expected in a short stature woman, particularly in Indian women. It is common. It okay, is normal. Okay, Only okay. more than two centimeter lag is considered as IUGR. Right? Okay, Otherwise, okay. generally one to two centimeter lag is common. It is expected. Okay. Yes, ma'am. In this patient, her whole trunk itself may not be thirty six centimeters. Okay, yes, so here the fundal height is expected to be at least one to two centimeters lesser. Okay, yes, so if you say patient height is one thirty eight centimeter and symphysis the fundal height is thirty six, this is difficult to believe for the examiners. Yes, so when you are doing the examination, always be careful how you take the measurement and that should be presented. So if you present like this, they'll take you for the bedside examination and ask you to do the bedside examination and measure the symphysis the fundal height properly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, ma'am. So that is the one important thing what I wanted to tell you. So your so, grips okay. are correct. You have written okay. perfectly. Fundal grip is correct. Lateral grip, yes. Right and left side you have mentioned. 
first pelvic grip you have mentioned and second pelvic yes, grip you have mentioned okay yes, right okay fine uh, head is engaged here very good okay, okay. that's a okay. correct part you have written and she is 39 weeks then definitely you are expected to be head is head, head engages at what period of gestation in a primary gravida at term yes by term by 37 to 38 weeks that's it generally expect the head to be engaged so yes from 39 weeks and head is engaged is it good or bad yes it's good it's a good case yes, so you have ruled yes. out inlet contraction already yes yes, yes. Come with the head is engaged that means yes, maybe the most of the short women has have got smaller babies also right small babies yes yes uh, yes so maybe that is that maybe her baby is also smaller here estimated fetal weight might, might have been less smaller here maybe she has a constitutionally smaller stature smaller baby also that is the head is engaged here so oh, okay okay ma'am understood so one important thing so when you mentioned of uh, subumbilical flattening my concern was it is often put a posterior malposition malposition yes. indirectly tells you that it is an abnormal pelvis or maybe there is a cpd right so oh, okay okay your the inlet cpd is already ruled out head is engaged so that is yes. a good factor for you so yes, you will yes, be happy yes. a term patient comes with uh, engaged head it is a good thing so oh, okay ma'am okay okay, okay. yeah so uh, 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 when you can you tell me what are the conditions or what are the causes for mobile head in a primary gravida at term multisays usually head engages only in the first stage of labor or uh, or always the when the contraction start in okay, prime at term you expect the head to be engaged but there are some conditions where the head is going to be mobile at term in primary oh. gravida can you tell okay. me some conditions for mobile head at term pregnancy uh it consists of two causes metallic causes and fetal causes in metallic causes there may be full bladder contracted pelvis or cpd or there may be polyhedromas in uh, fetal causes big baby or uh, deflexed head Uh, multiple pregnancies or short umbilical cord congenital anomalies can also present in fetal causes yes and you can say fetal placental clauses placenta previa oh. also you can include here oh, okay. okay okay so major degree placenta previa when it is occupying the lower segment then you feel that it is actually mobile oh, okay and in maternal causes you can include even the any other uh, uh, lower segment fibroid large lower segment fibroid obstructing okay oh, or any okay ma'am bony abnormalities yes oh, oh, so cpd okay. you mentioned contracted pelvis and cpd are one of the important causes commonest oh, oh. conditions as you mentioned are actually it could be rarely it could be full bladder once the head is engaged because of the full bladder it will not be lifted up okay, uh, oh, okay. that is quite rare but generally oh. one of the common conditions uh, where you see that it is actually you feel that it is uh, mobile head is one is wrong dates it could be a preterm head or okay. commonly it is polyhydramnios lycan is too high that is the reason no, why it, it is still floating okay, okay that there are the wrong, common conditions then followed by yes it could be cpd malposition as you mentioned it could be occipital posterior bro presentation where there is a deflexed head face presentation which lead to mobile head at term and fetal causes you mentioned yes fetal anomalies could be one of the important and you mentioned short card okay yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, even card around the leg, neck multiple loops of card around the neck okay, oh, okay. that can also lead to actually mobile head dot term oh, okay 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 you mentioned all the other causes conditions yes correct you are right yes okay fine yeah and uh, sorry one point i forgot to mention here yeah what is the definition of short stature you mentioned height 138 but i was concentrating on the bmi that time sorry uh, what is the okay. importance of height what i mean when you call it as a short stature women A height cutoff for short stature women. When the height is less than one one forty centimeters, ma'am. Less than one forty centimeters. Uh, generally, standard definition by for short stature is one forty five. One forty five. There is considered to be short stature women. But one forty is considered to be significant short stature. Okay. So if you say why why short stature is important. Then? Twenty percent of the women, twenty out of hundred, twenty percent of the women less than one forty-five are actually may have CPD. Oh, okay, my CPD. Okay. Eighty percent deliver normally, 
right that's what it means if 20% have cpd 80% will deliver normally that means because as you mentioned earlier smaller women have got smaller babies also smaller okay 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 ma'am yes yes will deliver okay but when the height is 140 40% of the women have got cpd so the height there is a sudden increase in the cpd rates as soon as the height becomes 140 and higher it's a very okay. significant that is 50 50 only 50% will deliver 50% you may or may not deliver that's how you count as a woman if the okay, height okay. 40 like that okay. Okay. so 140 is significant definitely okay but for definition of short stature it is 145 no okay okay ma'am okay definition of short stature is 145 cm yeah standard definition if you take uh, i mean uh, by a uh, statistical methods when when you take a specific population the mean height you have to take less than two standard deviations compared to that height will be the short stature but generally for indian women they say it is 147 okay but we okay. take 145 worldwide the definition has been always been the 145 cm is the cut off for short stature okay, okay. okay. 140 okay. is significant because the since the chances of having a cpd abruptly increases by 140 and after okay okay here it is definitely a very significant short height for her 138 is considered to be a significant uh, height Oh, right okay 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 yeah okay and asphaltation yeah you this is correct uh, fhr rate you have mentioned and here you have specifically written that it is left flank so i still think it is occipital posterior right yes ma'am yes yes you you wanted to say that it is occipital posterior that's why you have written it is in the it's heard in the flank it is not in the spinal umbilical it is lateral to the spinal umbilical generally on or medial to the spinal umbilical goes in favor of posterior lateral yes it could be because of the occipital posterior position posterior yes. okay that is the one thing okay yeah and i am very happy with your pv examination because you have not written sacral promontory what all findings you you should write for clinical pelvimetry and why you didn't write sacral promontory is not reached here okay so whenever you are writing the pelvis a uh, very important thing what i want to tell for the undergraduates is you need not do pv examination in the exam we oh, don't okay. ask about the pelvis pelvic assessment is mainly for the post graduates okay but they'll ask you the theory how do you do oh. pelvic assessment yes ma'am yes ma'am yeah pelvic assessment generally we write that here the one important thing is you have not written sacral promontory and you have not commented and obstetric conjugate again What is the purpose of measuring the obstetric conjugate? This this is which diameter, inlet, cavity, or outlet? How do you measure obstetric conjugate? Um, it is measured from the midpoint of the sacral promontory to the most prominent point on the back of the pubic symphysis, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Uh, so when you are doing pelvic like a inlet, pelvic examination, it is a pelvic inlet. Yes. It is measured for pelvic inlet. Pelvic inlet. Very good. Here the head is engaged. you need not measure the obstetric conjugate only when the head is mobile you will do a you have to measure the obstetric conjugate head is engaged it is for the pelvic inlet right oh okay fine conjugate is for the pelvic inlet oh okay okay right so it is head is already engaged that means it is cross the pelvic brim already okay okay so you need not measure the inlet measurements here you are measuring only the mid cavity and that is cavity and the outlet measurements only you will be writing oh, okay okay fine yes and generally what all points has to be mentioned i'll tell you once uh, you know you want to answer what all things are done in the clinical pelvimetry when you say how to assess the pelvis what all uh, some four five points has to be there minimum to say that pelvis is adequate um in in adequate pelvis the promoter can be easily cannot be easily palpated ma'am in inadequate pelvis the sacral promoter can be easily palpated and the sacrum is straight and the coccyx is prominent ma'am after assessing the sacrum uh the fingers are then moved laterally to feel the sacrospinous ligament uh if this ligaments are forward laterally this skill spines can be palpated ma'am okay uh vishal okay so i'll tell you the points uh we usually start from the above downwards or when you do done a pelvic examination the so prerequisites are one thing is the patient should have emptied the bladder you will inform the patient that she needs a pelvic examination pv examination has to be done and if there's a male student a female attender or a other some other female patient attender or at least a hospital healthcare worker 
staff nurse or a group D should be there. They're all prerequisites when you're doing a PV examination and using aseptic precautions, wearing a sterile glove, you'll start doing a PV examination. So the first thing when you're doing a clinical pelvimetry is you, you introduce your sterile, uh, in that, uh, with the sterile gloved fingers, index and the middle finger, you insert into the vaginal wall as deep as possible. And you have to depress your elbow. Your elbow should be depressed so that okay. you try to reach the sacral promontory. First thing okay. is to try to reach the sacral promontory. Okay. Majority okay. of the women, you will not be able to reach the sacral promontory. It's not easy. Even if you, depress, even if you ask the patient to come to the edge of the table and get the elbow, also, it is not easy to reach the bed. That okay. itself will be that diagonal conjugate or the obstetric conjugate is normal. Okay. Okay. Only if you feel the sacral promontory, if sacral okay. promontory is held, okay. so okay. you insert your fingers, you feel the sacral promontory, and okay. you that, I mean, at the uh, when, where your fingers are touching the lower border of pubic surfaces, you keep your uh, one other finger here, take out, and then you have to take the measurements in the end. Okay. okay. In, okay. First thing is you try to uh, see whether you can feel the sacrum. Okay. Okay. You have to take the measurements in the end once okay. you take out the okay. okay generally sacral promontory is not reachable that means okay. it is adequate no need to measure also oh, okay okay, okay. So first thing what you would do is you try to reach for the sacral promontory next okay, if it is not reached then you see whether the sacrum is well curved or not okay see oh. whether the sacrum is curved whether the sacrum is jetting forward like some okay. pelvic okay. abnormalities that sacrum is actually jetting forward it is not a curve okay. it is not a concave surface okay so okay. reach for the sacral promontory feel feel whether the sacrum is well curved okay then what okay, you okay. do is you feel for the on the lateral side feel for the sacrosciatic notches okay okay, okay. for the sacrospinous ligament sacrosciatic okay. notch you feel then you okay. feel for the pelvic wall lateral pelvic wall pelvic wall is felt from the as high as possible from the brim towards the ischial spine you feel whether they're converging or diverging Okay, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Next, you come to the ischial spine. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. I'll repeat again. Don't worry. The written was there. I'll repeat again. So next, once you feel for the lateral pelvic wall from the pelvic brim to the ischial spine, you feel on the either side. Okay. Then okay. come and feel for the ischial spine, both spines at a time. Okay. Okay. okay Generally, with stretched index and the middle finger, you will not be able to feel both spines at a time. Oh, okay, you will okay, be able to feel only one spine at a time separately. But if okay. you are able to feel both spines at a time, it is a, it is the cavity is actually contracted. It is, I mean, the outlet is actually contracted. Generally, okay. you will not be able to feel both the ischial spines simultaneously with your stretched out index and the middle finger. Okay. 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 So after that, you come outside, feel for the soft tissues. Is there any rigid perineum? That is like on the either side, you feel for the transverse perineum muscles. Okay. okay, okay yes. Then you feel for the Subpubic arch, the pubic okay. symphysis is there. You, uh, I mean, you, uh, in the pu in the pubis, you feel for the subpubic arch. It okay. is usually admits easily two fingers. Subpubic arch, the pu pubic arch usually admits the two fingers. Okay. Okay. Then before okay. taking out, if you feel that sacral promontory was reachable, then you take the measurement and then you come out. Okay. 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 Fine. That measurement okay. has to be taken. Then you put your four knuckles between the two ischial tuberosities or the perineum. Once you take oh, out okay. your hands, try okay, to fit your fine. four knuckles between the on the perineum between the two ischial tuberosities. Oh, okay, fine, fine. So I'll repeat again. So whenever you're mentioning bimanual pelvic examination, you have to say sacrum is not reached, sacral promontory is not reached, sacrum okay. is well curved. Okay, Sacrospinous okay. ligam, uh, sacrosciatic notch admits two fingers. Okay, ma'am. Lateral walls are diverging or parallel. Oh, okay, okay, ma'am. Inter ischial spine, uh, interspine, interspinous diameter, ISD. Interspinous diameter is average. Okay, okay, ma'am. Fine, fine. Then subpubic arch admits two fingers. Okay, ma'am. Transverse diameter of the outlet, TDO. By, yes, yes. Uh, by tuberous diameter admits four knuckles. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. So these are the things which has to be written. So normally in a gynecoid pelvis, sacral promontory is not reached. Sacrum is okay, well curved. And lateral okay, walls. How do you make out lateral pelvic wall is from the pelvic brim, swipe your fingers towards the ischial spine. 
Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Then you feel for the sacrosanctic notch, bispinous diameter between the two ischial spines. Yes, ma'am. Take out yes. your fingers. Do the between on the perineum between the two ischial tuberosities. You have to put your four knuckles. These four yes, knuckles should be you should be, you should be able to fit on the patient's perineum between the two ischial tuberosities. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. That is how you do a clinical pelvimetry. If you have felt okay. a sacral promontory, so if sacral promontory is reached, then when you have taken out after peeling for the subcubic arch, when you have taken out your fingers before taking out, take the measurement and take out and take the measurement that time. Okay, you have to okay. measure from okay. here to here. That will tell okay. you about the what is the. That what which measurement you are measuring? What is that measurement from sacral promontory to the inferior uh, part of the pubic symphysis? It is yes. diagonal conjugate. But a diagonal conjugate, yes. Okay. Uh, there will be some confusion when you are learning the measurements. Okay. Uh, uh, they usually ask you how do you measure the obstetric conjugate, or how do you yes. measure the pelvis clinical clinical pelvimetry? How do you say the pelvis is adequate? Okay. So generally, okay. we feel for the sacral promontory, see whether the sacrum is well curved or not. Okay. Yes, then you feel for the lateral pelvic wall, sweeping your fingers from the pelvic brim to the ischial spine. Then okay, sacrosciatic notches. Okay. High spinous diameter. Okay. Take okay, out your before taking out subcubic arch. Then yes, take out your fingers and feel for the transverse diameter of the outlet. Or the okay, bituberous okay. diameter. Okay. Okay. Other additional is once you've taken out, you can uh, keep your thumb and the index finger on the inferior pubic ramus on the both the sides, on the patient's pelvis, inferior pubic ramus on the both the sides. Okay. What is the angle? Okay. If it is very small pelvis, contracted pelvis, inferior the subpubic arch also cannot admit two fingers okay. between the inferior pubic ramus, and also this angle is also acute. Okay. Generally, it is more than ninety degrees. It you will be able to keep your thumb under index finger on the inferior pubic arches. It is a broader angle. A broader angle. Okay. Adequate pelvis. Adequate pelvis. Okay. Yes. And yes. once the head is okay, in this, in these whatever measurements I mentioned, the first thing when I told you about the sacrum is reach, uh, sacral promontory is reached and sacrum is well covered or not, it will tell you about the inlet. Yes, okay. Yes. For inlet, yes. the only measurement for the inlet is actually. To what you are measuring is actually a diagonal conjugate. A diagonal conjugate, yes. One point five to two centimeter minus the diagonal conjugate will tell you about the obstetric conjugate. Obstetric conjugate. Shortest distance, shortest AP diameter. Yes. Okay. So diagonal conjugate will tell you about the AP inlet. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Sacrosciatic yes. notches and lateral pelvic wall, whether they are converging, diverging, parallel, lateral pelvic wall. Yes. So lateral pelvic wall and the sacrosciatic notches will tell you about the cavity. Cavity. Yes. For the outlet, bispinous diameter between the two ischial spines. Bispinous ischial diameter, spine. subcubic arch, subcubic and the arch, okay. transverse diameter of the outlet. Yes. By tuberous diameter, these three will tell you about the outlet. Outlet. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. If the head is engaged. You need not measure the inlet, right? Okay. If the head has gone, if the fetal head has gone into the pelvis, it has always okay. already crossed the pelvic brim. Okay. No need to measure about the obstetric conjugate. So that time so, we need not comment on the sacral promontory. Okay. Okay. Fine. Okay. You got it. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So when do we call it as prominent spines? No, prominent spines is uh, by feel only you can make out whether they are jetting inside. Whether the, uh, because of the soft tissues, they are not easily felt sometimes. But if you if you are able to easily feel the spines, okay, and they are jetting inside the cavity, or when you are able to easily feel both the spines between with your uh, stretched out thumb and the index finger, then it is ISD is less. Or you can it's basically by the feel only you can say that they are jetting inside. They are, they are prominent ischial spines. How you feel the ischial spine? Okay. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. So here, sacral promontory uh, and all you need not mention. Here it need not be mentioned because head is engaged. So the pelvic examination in your case should have been pel side walls are actually parallel or converging. Okay. Interspinous okay. diameter is less than the average. I by spinous diameter ISD interspinous diameter okay. is less than the average. That means you are easily able to touch. Okay, I, I assume so. And then subcubic angle is acute or it doesn't admit uh, uh, two fingers subcubic arch. Then sub uh, subcubic angle is acute and outlet. Outlet admits three knuckles, four knuckles. That should be written here. 
But uh, you need not mention the sacral promontory or the pelvic inlet measurement. We need not okay. mention here because head is engaged. That's a one plus okay. point in your case. Okay. Right? Okay. Okay. You understood about the clinical pelvimetry? Yes, ma'am. Understood, ma'am. Yes. You want to repeat once? No, I no, know I have told, but I will not know whether you have understood or not. Or maybe if I have told some little bit, uh, I just mention the important basic points. Like how, if they ask you how do you do pelvimetry, remember inlet, pelvic inlet, it is diagonal. Okay. Okay. For cavity, lateral Sacrosy. pelvic wall, and sacrosciatic notches. Notch. For, For outlet, outlet minus uh, diameter, subcubic angle, and transverse diameter of the outlet or the bituberous diameter. Inter spinous diameter, bituberous diameter. Both are for cavity, uh, for outlet. Okay. Okay. So all this five points should be there. Sacral promontory is not reached. Sacrum is well curved. Uh, lateral pelvic wall is parallel or converging or diverging. Sacrosciatic notch admits two fingers. Bispinous diameter average, less than average. Subpubic angle uh, is acute or obtuse or Subpubic arch admits two fingers that you can mention, which is easy to measure generally. Subpubic arch is easy to measure with two fingers when you're doing a pelvic examination. Then okay. bituberous diameter is four knuckles. Okay. Okay. So these are the five, six points which should be there in the clinical pelvimetry. Okay. Okay. Uh, so okay. can you tell me how do we assess for the CPD? This is pelvis. It's okay. Okay. Uh, can you tell me what is contracted pelvis? By definition, what is contracted pelvis? Um, means alteration in shape and size of the pelvis to such a degree that the normal the baby cannot be delivered out. Yes. Okay. Uh, that is contracted pelvis. You have an anatomical definition and the obstetrical definition. What you mentioned was the obstetrical definition. Yes, that is a uh, most working uh, definition. Yes, when there is a uh, alteration in the size and shape of the pelvis to a sufficient degree so that it will alter the normal mechanism of labor. Okay, that is the okay. obstetrical definition. The anatomical definition is when one or more of the essential diameters are reduced by 0.5 centimeter. Okay. You know the measurements. We measure, we tell no transverse diameter in the inlet, oblique diameter, AP diameter, like that. Okay. okay. So when yes. one or more of the essential diameters are reduced by 0.5 centimeters, then it is called as contracted pelvis for I'm anatomical reason. Right. For optical definition, any any change in the size and shape of the pelvis which can affect the normal mechanism considered to be a contracted pelvis. The contracted pelvis. Yes, what is yes. cephalo pelvic proportion? Uh, it means a relative uh, disparity between the metal head and the pater pelvis is called CPD. Yes, good. So, cephalopelvic disproportion is actually there is a disparity in the relationship between the metal pelvis and the fetal head. Either fetal head can be bigger okay. or the pelvis can be smaller or the pelvis can still be normal. So, contracted yes, pelvis doesn't mean that CPD or all the CPDs are not because of contracted pelvis. Contracted okay. pelvis could be one of the cause for CPD, but CPD can be caused by many mm -hmm. other reasons. Okay, okay, fine. Yes. Okay, so what are the causes for CPD? We, you mentioned, fetal, uh, yeah, you tell, we mentioned about the mobile head actually. Most of them yes, actually are causes for CPD also. Okay, okay so what okay. are the causes for CPD? Uh, yeah, so CPD is cephalopelvic. Some conditions for the fetal, some conditions for the pelvic abnormalities again here. Okay. So pelvic uh, abnormalities include because of polyhydramnios or uh, oh, okay. presenta previa. Mobile head, mobile polyhydramnios will not come here. You mentioned about the pelvic abnormality like congenital and acquired. Congenital are you uh, you meant uh, you have heard of Rob uh, this one Nagel Nagel's pelvis Robertson's pelvis. Oh yes, ma'am. Yeah, Con that is the conditions for the abnormal pelvis. So maternal conditions so, are abnormal pelvis. Fetal conditions will be abnormal head. That caput succedinum cephalometoma. Okay. So we are dis discussing the what are the causes for cephalopelvic disproportion, CPD. You mentioned the uh, contracted pelvis conditions first. Okay. okay. 
So what are the causes for contracted pelvis? Pelvis is short. Okay. Either it could be congenital or it could be acquired. Congenital is like either one ala of the sacrum by development itself, ala of the sacrum is absent, one side or both sides. That is okay. Nagelis pelvis and Robertson's uh, pelvis. Okay. They're congenital conditions. Acquired conditions could be like you mentioned, rickets, osteomalacia, or it could be fracture, road traffic accident, patient has met with a fracture of the hip. Okay. 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 Yeah. Or tuberculosis of the hip, hip osteoarthritis. Hip okay. Post. okay. So okay. they are all acquired conditions of the pelvis. Okay. Okay. So okay. these are congenital and acquired conditions of the pelvis. Okay. Or kyphoscoliosis. Oh. You mentioned yeah, about the lumbar abnormalities. Yes. They all come under contracted pelvis causes. Okay. Oh, or okay. Okay. Maternal causes of CPD. Maternal causes of CPD is nothing but conditions for the contracted pelvis. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. In that congenital and acquired, you have to write. Okay. Oh, then okay. fetal causes include you mentioned hydrocephalus. Yes. Or there can be a large baby. Yes, big baby. Yes. Baby is very big. Okay. Or it could be malposition. Okay, because yes, of the malposition, there is a CPD. Like, uh, the fetus could be deflexed head, occipital posterior, bro, bro, uh, face presentation. There is a deflexed head. That is why there is a CPD. Oh, okay, okay, ma'am. Fine, fine. Okay, yeah. So you, we usually tend to confuse with the contracted pelvis and CPD, but definitions you mentioned properly, yes. Contracted pelvis, pelvis. Cephalopelvic disproportion can be normal pelvis also, where the baby can be bigger. There is a okay, disparity okay. between these two relationships, fetal head and the pelvis. Okay, okay. Fine, fine, fine. So, all the maternal causes of contracted pelvis will be causes for the CPD. Oh, fetal okay. causes of CPD will be hydrocephalus, fetal head abnormalities, or even fetal neck goiter, large goiter, thyroid, large goiter abnormalities, any fetal neck tumors. Okay, okay. Fine. they are any deflexed head. Bro presentation, face presentation, occipital posterior, abnormal malpositions. Okay. Okay. okay they fine. All are the uh, are also causes for CPD, fetal causes of CPD. Okay, fine. You understood the causes for CPD? Yes, ma'am. Understood. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, how do we assess for the CPD? I told you about the pelvis. How do we assess the, the pelvis? pelvis? But pelvis, this is yes, you want to know the disparity between the head and the pelvis. Okay, ma'am. Fine. Clinical pelvimetry is for the pelvis. Pelvis. Okay, ma'am. Fine. CPD is for the to know the relationship between the currently whatever fetus weight, is, whatever is her pelvis between these two. Okay, ma'am. Fine. Understood. Okay. Yeah. So, what are the tests to assess for the CPD? There is some, one more word called as fetopelvic disproportion. You heard fetopelvic disproportion? No, ma'am. I didn't hear. CPD is Cephalopelvic. That is when the vertex, yes. when the cephalic presentation is there, that time you can assess for the CPD. Yes. If it's a brief yes, presentation, yes. that time we will not call it a CPD, right? It is a oh, presentation. Okay, so, so ideally it should be called as fetopelvic disproportion. Okay, fine. Okay, yes. Fetopelvic disproportion is disparity between the fetal presenting part and the pelvis. Okay, okay. Here it is head and the pelvis because 99% okay. of the time it is head. Yes. So commonly we use it as CPD, but ideally it should be fetopelvic disproportion. Oh, okay. okay. Yes. So if there is a cephalic presentation, so how do we assess for the cephalo, uh, cephalopelvic disproportion? There is a disparity. How do we know that there is a disparity or there is a no CPD? It is normal. So how do we assess for that? Uh, there are two methods. Third person, man. one is iron donut method and uh, motor care milder method. Man. In iron donut method, a two fingers of the clinician right hand are placed over the pubic symphysis. It is grasped by the left hand and is pushed downwards and backwards into the pelvis. Um, if the head can be pushed down into the pelvis, it indicates no CPD. The head can be pushed down a little, but with slight overlapping, it indicates moderate CPD. If the head cannot be pushed down, it indicates severe CPD. These are the inferences for. Uh, I don't know method, ma'am. For Mundrokir Muller method, uh, two, the fingers of the clinician's right hand are introduced into the vagina with the fingertips placed to the ischial spines. At note, the descent of the head and the thumb over the front of the pubic symphysis. Uh, same thing, the fetal head is grasped by the left hand and is pushed downwards and backwards into the pelvis. 
uh, if the head can be pushed down, there is no overlapping of the parietal bone or the synthesis pubis. It indicates no CPD. If the head can be pushed down, that's a slight overlapping. It indicates moderate CPD. If the head cannot be pushed down, it indicates severe CPD. These two methods for assessment. Oh. Okay. So they're all also called as abdominal method and abdominal vaginal method. Vaginal method. Yes. So abdominal method of assessing the CPD, what you mentioned was the hand or not method. So yes, where you're, it's only abdominal. Okay. Yes, so both the hands are under over the abdomen. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, right. So both hands are under. So the uh, here the left uh, right hand the fingers index and the what you are doing is you are keeping over the pubic symphysis, okay? Yes, and yes. with the left hand you are pushing the fetal head yes, downwards and back, head. like you are guiding it towards the pelvis. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Yes. So if the head can be pushed without any override, you are I mean you you are, you are easily able to push without any crossing over on your pubic symphysis fingers. That means there is no CPD. But okay, you are okay. able to push, but there is slight overlap of the fetal parietal bone for the inner surface of your pubic symphysis. Then there is a mild CPD. Okay. Slight CPD, okay, is moderate. There, you are okay, not able to push at all. Okay. Yes, there is a yes, significant yes. overlap or your fetal head is significant overlap on your pubic symphysis, on, on your pubic symphysis uh, fingers, then it is severe CPD. Severe CPD. Okay. Okay, so, okay. Same thing what you are doing is in the abdominal vaginal method. In the abdominal vaginal method, again, the left hand, you are trying to do push the fetal head downwards and backwards into the pelvis. Okay. Okay. Catch hold okay. the lower abdomen, fetal, uh, fetal head, you should try to catch hold and you try to push. But here the finger should be, it. you are inserting two fingers, index and the middle finger at the level okay. of ischial spine. The tip of your finger should be at the level of ish your ischial spine. Okay, okay, okay. Ma okay. And yes, the thumb yes. should be on the pubic symphysis. The pubic symphysis, yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. That is the Munrokar modification of Muller method, right? Mundrokar, that was the modification. Yes, yes. Okay. So yes, then here also you are trying to push the fetal head to see okay. whether you are able to push it till the ischial spine. So if yes, you are yes, able yes. to push the fetal head till the ischial spine without any overlap over the pubic symphysis, no CPD. You are okay, able okay. to push the fetal head, but not up to the ischial spine. Okay. okay. Then yes, there is yes, yes. to moderate CPD. Okay. Not able okay, to push, okay, okay. and your there is an overlap of the fetal parietal bone over the pubic symphysis thumb or the finger. Then it is a severe CPD, major degree. Severe CPD. CPD. Major degree. Yes, okay. yes. Yeah. So that is what you mean by the you assess for the CPD. Generally, CPD. abdominal method, abdominal vaginal method. These two methods are used. Okay. In yes, your yes, case, you need not assess. You need not do that because it is already engaged. Here you yes, need not try to push. It is already engaged. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. So only thing what you have to assess is only cavity and the outlet has to be measured using clinical pelvimetry. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So what is the ideal time to assess for the pelvis or the CPD? Which is the ideal time to assess for the CPD? Like patient is short stature in the early pregnancy or she's come at 30, 30 to 4 weeks. Should we do the, should we assess for the pelvis? The time only? Like we no, can plan for cesarean section earlier. Yes, ma'am. So when should, what is the ideal time? For primary gravida, it is uh, 38 weeks, ma'am. Okay. So generally it is term pregnancy. Ideally term pregnancy, it is here. Yes. But the best time to assess for the pelvis is during labor. When the patient comes in early labor. Okay. Y yes, ma'am. When the, when the patient comes in early labor, start of the labor, that is the time to assess the pelvis because fetal head is the best pelvic meter. If it enters the pelvis, that itself uh, tells you that inlet is adequate. You need not do so many other tests. Okay. When you're trying to get gra uh, grasp the fetal head, trying to push, it causes a lot of discomfort for the woman. It may not be possible yes. in a verbese woman. Or when the liker is more, you will not be able to push, but it will give you a false positive result of CPD. Okay. okay. So there are so many drawbacks of doing that in the antenatal part. In the okay. early labor okay. part, usually patients are also cooperative and there is a usually soft tissue distensibility is also there. Like during labor, what happens? There is a giveaway of the pelvis. So soft tissue yes, distensibility. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma good uterine contractions. Yes, and, yes, yes. Yeah. All those multiple factors contribute to, to assess the pelvis very in a better way or in a better way. Oh, okay, okay, fine. So Understood. early labor is the best time, ideal time to assess the pelvis. Okay. Okay, if the patient is too short stature, you don't want her to come in the labor like late. If, if many patients uh, have to travel long time, by the time they reach the hospital, they may be uh, they may go into obstructed labor. 
yes okay. yes yes so in those cases yes maybe you can do it a term pregnancy 38 okay. weeks completed you can do a term pregnancy because ideal time to plan for cesarean section for elective in case of contracted pelvis is also by 39 weeks not before oh, okay. that okay. okay so ideal time will be for by 39 weeks we do most of the time okay. unless there is a, uh, some other uh, problem medical problem like pre eclampsia or something is there otherwise we usually terminate the pregnancy only by 39 to 40 weeks so ideal time okay. will be only after completing the term pregnancy by 38 it only your cesarean pelvis Have yes, a doubt. Yes, ma'am. For a well built, yes, well built woman without any risk factors, you need not do yes, pelvic examination for everyone. We usually do it in the early labor. Early labor, okay, ma'am. That's true. Okay. So that is the best time to do the pelvic examination and to assess for the CPD. The CPD, okay. yes, ma'am. What is the, what do you mean by trial of labor? You heard trial of labor? Uh, by definition, it is a conduct of spontaneous labor. in case of moderate uh, degree of cervical pelvic disproportion uh, in an institution under a uh, supervision man very good that's the definition for trial of, trial of labor. labor yeah so generally we give a trial of labor you suspect that there is some mild to moderate uh, cpd when with your assessment okay but you feel that hey, yes. baby is also smaller baby like short stature but baby is also sm smaller maybe like when the contraction start when the uterine contraction starts yes. maybe the head gets engaged okay then maybe you you can give a trial of labor and see for the progress of labor okay so trial of labor yes, is basically is uh, done to uh, basically allow the women for a vaginal delivery with a mild to moderate cpd in a institutional setup you can do that yes, yes. keeping everything yes, ready yes. for the cesarean section you can give a trial of labor and watch for the progress any time you suspect yes, that there is a delay in the progress of labor you can give them for the cesarean section without allowing the women to go for obstructed labor okay why we say in sentences you should it should, should not go into obstructed labor so that immediately you will be able to take up the cesarean section that is the purpose okay. of giving the trial of labor usually trial of labor is usually given only for mild to moderate like if you are suspecting severe cpd is there you will not give a trial of labor or when there is an obvious okay. indication for cesarean section is there like patient is a elderly more than 35 years or she has got okay. multiple risk factors pre eclampsia gdm okay, okay obviously okay. there is a big Thank baby you. you will not do Only if it's an average size okay. baby between two point five to three point five kg, average size baby. Yes, you will give a trial of labor. Okay, yes, so mild to moderate CPD, spontaneous onset of labor, and it should be a cephalic presentation, cephalic presentation ideally again, and average size of baby in an institution setup. All this okay, should be the prerequisites should be there for giving a trial of labor, so that we will be able okay. to monitor the labor using photogram. In case there is a maternal fetal distress, is there you will be able to terminate pregnancy by yes. cesarean section. Okay. Cesarean section. Yes, I understand. Yeah. So successful trial is when the mother delivers a healthy baby. Both mother yes, and baby yes. are fine, either by spontaneous yes, delivery or by assisted delivery. You can use forceps and vacuum, but if the mother and baby are fine, then it's called as a successful trial of labor. Successful trial of labor. Yes, I understand. A mother delivers, but baby is still born. Our baby has got birth asphyxia. Then it is a, it's not a successful trial. To call this yes, a successful yes, trial of labor, both mother and baby should be fine. It can be normal delivery or it can be assisted delivery also using episiotomy, forceps, and vacuum. Yes, understood. Okay. Okay. So that is what you mean by a trial of labor and a successful trial of labor. Successful trial. Okay. 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 Fine. Yeah. uh so i am not going to to details of your case summary and all you have written everything is correct and uh, yes, yeah and diagnosis also you want to mention yeah you tell me the diagnosis um when you the diagnosis at a date old premi gravid at 39 weeks with the contractor pelvis and with anemia complicating pregnancy with singleton live pretus and separate presentation with adequate ligature and not in labor yes okay, okay yeah You are right. Huh? So okay. ideally, in term pregnancies, always make it a habit to write the estimated fetal weight in the examination. I think that's the one point you have missed there. So that's the only thing. Okay. Uh, okay. Here with contracted pelvis, because you have mentioned that obstetric conjugate is less than nine centimeters. Okay. So generally, when you say obstetric conjugate is less than ten centimeter, are you measure the diagonal conjugate one point five to two centimeter less than the diagonal conjugate will give you obstetric conjugate. When the obstetric conjugate is less than ten centimeter. By spinous diameter less than ten centimeter. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Yes. Okay, With ma by peritoneal diameter more than ten centimeter, should you should give your 
probable clue regarding CPD. Okay, okay, ma'am. Understood. So just remember 10, 10 as a number. When the obstetric conjugate is less than 10 centimeter. Okay. When the okay, bispinous diameter is less than 10. Okay, ma'am. And when the biparital diameter, when the fetal head BPD, like in the ultrasound measurements we get, right? Biparital okay, diameter at term. If it is more than 10, okay. you should be careful. They okay, give you a clue regarding the cephalopelvic disproportion. That is Okay, and fine. so you, you can make out in like in, in a clinical in a clinical setup. When can you suspect is when you feel that easily you are able to reach the sacral promontory? Easily able no. to reach the ischial spines, both spines at a time, or when the ultrasound tells you that BPD at term it is more than ten centimeters. You should be careful to give a trial of labor, not in a PHC and a CHC or a smaller hospital. You should you, you can you should be very careful and it should be assessed by the senior obstetrician ideally oh. before you plan okay. for the termination of pregnancy. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, any doubts you have, or anything you want me to discuss? discuss but because it's a Sunday and already the time is also done, I don't want to waste you people's time also. Any other doubts? You want, you have any doubts regarding the measurements or anything you want to know? Symphysis of fundal height. I uh, I did uh, tell you. I think did you mention the uh, this thing? Abdominal girth, did I tell you? When you measure the abdominal girth, from when to when you measure the abdominal girth? No, but you didn't tell about that abdominal. Yeah, abdominal girth should be measured 30 weeks onwards. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So the fundal height is measured from when to when? During the, that. Uh, from which period uh, of gestation to which period of gestation? Simple as the fundal height. From 32 to 36. From 24 to 36 uh, weeks. Uh, 24 to 36 weeks, yes. Abdominal girth is measured after 30 weeks, up till term. Up till term. Mm -hmm. And abdominal girth increases one inch per week. Oh, okay. After 30 weeks of in a pregnancy, abdominal girth increases one inch per week till term. By term pregnancy, it is usually 95 to 100 centimeters. Oh, okay. Fine. More than 100 is told to be over distended abdomen. Oh, okay. Fine. Okay, yeah. So investigations, uh, you know, what other? What do you mean by routine? Here the, yeah. Hmm. So what are the routine investigations in pregnancy? Routinely, what you what all tests you do in all the pregnant women? Uh, we have to do hemoglobin, blood grouping, RH typing, urine culture, uh, VDRL, and uh, RPR, um, HPSAG, and um, albumin, serum and bilirubin level. So this. Okay, so routine investigations in pregnancy. You may do some tests like depending upon whether she's a GDM, preeclampsia, like that. Okay, but routinely, what all the tests are done in the all the pregnant women are one is actually hemoglobin estimation, urine routine for urine. protein sugar microscopy. Okay. Okay. Protein sugar okay. microscopy. Urine culture is not routine. Culture we don't do for everyone. Urine oh. routine for protein urine sugar routine. microscopy is a routine test. Okay, okay. so Fine. hemoglobin, urine routine for protein sugar microscopy. Uh, serum VDRL, HBSAG, HIV, screening test for GDM, whichever method you follow. But one, that screening test has to be done universally for all the pregnant women. For everyone, it has to be done. GDM screening. Okay, like you mentioned, DIPSI test in your institute. DIPSI okay, test is fine. a screen. That has to be done for every woman. Okay. okay and then anomaly scan. Anomaly scan. These are the compulsory tests which has to be done for, done, by all, done for all the pregnant women as per the Government of India recommendation in HMA. Okay, fine. Okay. There are some organizations which say that NT scan also should be compulsory, but as of now, Government of India recommendation doesn't include that. NHM doesn't include in the recommendation. Okay, but if you okay. have a facility, you can do, but it may not be available in the rural setup and all that easily. So, but anomaly scan is definitely has to be done. Okay. Hemoglobin yes, estimation, blood grouping and RH typing, urine protein for protein sugar microscopy, serum VDRL, HBSAG, HIV. Screening okay. for GDM, ultrasound anomaly scan. Okay. Additional investigation you can do depending upon your setup is thyroid profile and NT scan, nuchal translucency scan. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And you wanted uh, somebody had to, you wanted to know the investigations for CPD as such. Uh, we don't do any investigations. We usually do only standard clinical pelvimetry because okay. fetal head is the best pel pelvimeter. So we wait till the onset of labor and then assess, which will give you easy clues. Okay. Investigations okay. for uh, CPD or contacted pelvis. 
radiological pelvimetry at uh, either using a ct mri or even x ray is not done they are very tedious and they are not standardized methods also to assess for the cpd okay okay fine fine yeah yeah in the, in the new trials regarding the cpd okay there are no new trials as such uh regarding the trial of labor and cpd as such there is no new trials okay but one thing for the normal labor instead of the partogram now we have got a new labor care guide by the who like earlier we were waiting for the four hours there's a alert line and action line with the four hours gap so if there is any crossing of the four hours line with good uterine contraction there is a delayed progress of labor we would take them up as a action you have to do some action has to be done okay but now new labor care guide by who has actually given additional timing provided both maternal and fetal condition are good you can give adequate time extra additional time for the progress of labor and the cut off for starting of the partogram yes now it is 5 cm for the new labor care guide partogram had the partogram you would start from 4 cm dilatation but new labor care guide actually starts with the 5 cm dilatation and you have got additional time for each and every cut off of the dilatation provided both maternal and fetal conditions are good 